in their own experience. And those that have had a major loss in life, um, those that have, uh, have, have had to and maybe possibly still uh, struggle to some degree and cope with a whole range of crisis issues, the divorce uh, crises, the loss of job, loss of health, and uh, loss of opportunity, and of course, loss of a loved one. It is sad that in Australia, while you and I sit here tonight, every four hours, someone is committing suicide. Every four hours in Australia, someone commits suicide. Sri Lanka has the world's highest suicide rate, but Australia, in par with New Zealand, has the highest teenage suicide rate in the Western industrialized world. Last year I was in Germany speaking not on this subject but on other subjects and anyone that's been away from your native culture longs to hear your own language and I noticed as they put me in this little motel and I noticed before a service that they were advertising a subject or a program uh, something about Australia and I eagerly sort of waited to get home from the meeting to talk about or so that to listen to something about uh, from Australia. And to my, heart, my heart sank as this program in my native language was the epidemic of suicide in Australia. And that's all the way over in Germany. Something fundamentally is wrong. But if you had have asked me just a little over seven years ago what I thought about grief, I would have said good grief. I mean, grief in my vocabulary was really for those weak people who really couldn't get their act together in life. I don't remember any time ever in the churches that I've pastored ever addressing the issue or the subject of grief or crisis or crisis. But something happened just a little over seven years that has changed my life. I'd been out speaking at a minister's conference in uh, Indonesia, something like 800 delegates, and then I went from there to Cairo, Egypt. I've been there to Cairo, Egypt for uh, three times. I've always enjoyed the stimulus and still do of traveling. I came back to the Gold Coast where my wife was and our beautiful 24 and a half year old daughter. And uh, I sort of was there just for a few days and I went to New Zealand to do a five-night sort of crusade in a place called Whakatari, New Zealand. I was speaking on the last night on a subject that I've spoken on many times before, and it's called the, the bounce-back factor, and it's keys of how people can be resilient in the tough times. I use the analogy of an eagle, how the eagle, would you know, has a, lock a locking mechanism on its wings or in its wings and it uses the air current and the turbulence of the adverse air current to rise higher unlike the other birds that struggle and fight against the storm and the air current sometimes they lose power and they plummet to their death but a, a bird of courage a bird of power this eagle rises to greater heights and I use this illustration to illustrate how that when tough times come that we can be resilient in our tough times. I gave an altar call and the, uh, the response from the audience, from the congregation was very positive and I felt very much satisfied because it was my last night of the five night meetings in Whakatane, New Zealand. Little did I know that while I was speaking that the next day that I would receive a phone call that would challenge me in everything that I've ever spoken of, especially on the bounce back factor that would change my life. And the phone call was that our beautiful 24 and a half year old daughter was in a life support, on a life support on the, in the Gold Coast of Australia here. You could have blown me over with a feather. You see friends, immediately when you and I are confronted with bad news, shock, the mind, in order not to self-destruct, has a buffer zone and there are shades of denial. And you know, when tragedy, when harm, when hurt, when disappointment hits us for, for a moment of time, sometimes this happens more than for a moment of time, our mind, our spirit, our heart reels and sometimes we, put a, we go into a denial syndrome and we say, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. 
and I was positive they had the wrong person. Well, to cut a long story short, our 24-year-old daughter struggled for the next seven days, eight days from the time that she, she was taken to the hospital with something that seemed to be so very simple. She had two wisdom teeth out, that's all, and they become infected and her whole system was poisoned. And eight days after a horrific storm, she passed on to be with her Lord and friend. Now, people say to me, they say, now, hey, you're a minister, and they say to me, what was it like? And they sort of expect me to say, well, the, the, you know, the room filled with shafts of light and angels, and we were so full of the peace of God. Well, I want to tell you, it was like hell. And I want to be honest here tonight, dear friends, because my credential for speaking like this is that I've been to the bottom, emotionally, spiritually, physically, but I also know what it is to be substantially healed. And I know what it is to, to be healed emotionally. I know what it is to be healed physically. And I know what it is to be able to appropriate or experience what I've spoken about in times gone by, the bounce back factor. My heart goes out to people that are exposed to grief and sorrow and pain. Just last year, a group of businessmen in Auckland, New Zealand, were concerned about the high-rising youth suicide rate. They put me on a plane, flew me over, and we were able to open a segment uh, into the community there in Auckland uh, uh, and speak to dignitaries and so on and so on about the rising tide of suicide. I want to tell you this, that my heart goes out to people, and especially Christians, and also all sorts of people from every walk of life that are reeling under the trauma of life. If I get a little bit stirred tonight, dear friends, especially about the church, not this church, the church down the road, it's because, as your pastor said, that I believe the church of Jesus Christ has to come up with some answers. I believe that in the words of, of Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 15, he said, I sat where they sat. And some of us need to learn to sit. We need to learn to listen. We need to walk slowly through people and hear the cry of their spirit and their heart. I will not quote the author of this book, but it's this sort of material, friends, that can I say makes my blood boil. This is a book, this man is a well-known evangelist worldwide. And this is the sort of material that has, that has promoted, that gives the wrong idea about grief. And by the time we finish the seminar, friends, I will, I will re-emphasize, I trust and I'm confident that you will be assured of this fact, that grief is not negative, that grief can be my ally, grief can be my friend, Grief is necessary to walk through the trauma or in biblical vernacular to be able to walk through the valley of a shadow of death. That grief is a vehicle for me to walk through, for you to walk through, so that we can know what it is to be healed emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. And so here we have this book exposing the deadly nature of grief. In other words, that when I'm impacted with loss, when something that I love is suddenly torn away from me, it is wrong for me to grieve. Well, I want to tell you this, friends. It's unnatural for you not to grieve. And I'm here to tell you this. As I've written this latest book just released this morning here in Australia to my church, one of the first requirements for those that are grieving, this is a hundred do's and don'ts to the griever and to the caregiver. I say, number one, be kind on yourself. You see, here we have people that have had someone or something that's been brutally snatched away from their life. They're looking for someone to at least understand them in their world. And they come into the Christian culture, and what the Christian culture does, emotionally, either verbally or by putting what I term a cloak of silence or a cloak of a conspiracy of silence over them, and they sort of stand aloof from these people. I believe, dear friends, the church of Jesus Christ should be the house of refuge. Yeah. It's the place of healing. It's the place of warmth. It's the place where we should have some support system. 